Hello class and welcome to your chapter 8 lecture. Today we're going to be discussing alcohol, looking now at the behavioral effects. So the learning objectives for this lesson, by the end you should be able to cite the countries with the highest and lowest rates of alcohol consumption, discuss the major ways alcohol is costly to our society, discuss the main events of the temperance movement and the prohibition era, define alcoholism, and identify the general characteristics of an alcoholic, explain how culture influences views about alcohol, list four cultural factors that affect our views about alcohol consumption, list four findings about alcohol consumption in college students, provide three reasons why the effects of alcohol consumption differ between men and women, Understand the differences between codependency and enabling behaviors. And list two major factors that alcohol treatment must consider. So let's look at alcohol consumption in the United States. So in 2018, there were 139.8 million current drinkers aged 12 years and older. So a current drinker is one who's had at least one drink in the past 30 days. 67.1 million binge alcoholic users. Binge users are described as having five or more drinks in a row on a single occasion. 16.6 million heavy alcohol users. So heavy use is considered five or more drinks on the same occasion on each of the five days in the past 30 days or more than one drink a day for women and more than two drinks a day for men or any drinking at all by pregnant women or underage youth. I also want to mention that nearly half of current drinkers are in fact binge drinkers and one eighth are heavy drinkers. Okay, now moving on. So let's look at some trends in alcohol consumption. 38% of United States adults do abstain from alcohol. Eight out of 10 upper income American college graduates drink alcohol. Americans who attend religious services weekly are less likely to drink. North African and the Middle East have very low alcohol consumption rates. The prevalence of drinking is highest in West Europe and Australia. Men are more likely than women to drink. People most likely to drink have higher incomes, are under the age of 65, do not attend church, live in regions other than the South, and typically identify as liberal. And the economic burden falls on taxpayers, typically who do not abuse alcohol, through government, private insurance, and non-using household members. So when we look at the pyramid model, so according to the 2015 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, 86% of people age 18 and older reported that they drank alcohol at some point in their lifetime. 70% reported that they drank in the past year, and 56% reported that they drank in the past month. So looking at the pyramid model here, you can see what I was just describing. The heavy users, moderate, then you have some occasional users here. So let's look at some dual problems of underage and adult drinking. Looking at underage alcohol use, alcohol is the substance most widely used by teenagers. In 2018, 43% of 12th graders 26% of 10th graders and 9.2% of 8th graders reported that they were drunk at least one time in their life. An estimated 9% of adolescents, which is the ages between 12 and 17, report that they were current alcohol users. And 1.2 million said that they were past month binge drinkers. So in the past month, they had binge drank at least once. 131,000 131, are current heavy drinkers. 
and 401,000 reported that they had a past alcohol use disorder. That's concerning when we're talking about underage alcohol use. So those who are under the age of 21, under the age to legally drink. When we look at alcohol use by ethnicity and race, we find here that whites are more likely to report current use, binge, and heavy use. Whereas Asians have the lowest overall rates of binge or heavy use across all age groups. When we look at driving under the influence, in two th these statistics are from 2018. So 8% under the age of 12, drove under the influence at least one time in the preceding year. Males are more likely than females to have a DUI, and the highest rates of DUIs are seen among those 21 to 25. Other factors that are related to alcohol use include education, so it's interesting that rates of alcohol use actually increased with increasing education level. Though college grads are less likely to be heavy or binge drinkers than those with only some college education. Taking a look at age, this data is from 2018. We see that between the age group of 18 to 25, we have roughly the same percentages, if not greater, of current binge and heavy drinkers than we do of those who were over the age of 26. And when we look at employment status, we see that 64.8% of people who were over the age of 18 and employed full-time reported to be current users. And similar rates of binge users were found for those who were employed versus unemployed, which stayed around 31%. So employment status really didn't have an effect on whether someone was a binge drinker. So when we talk about all of these statistics, all these percentages of who's drinking, how much, what does that mean? Why do we care? There are economic costs to alcohol abuse. So there are expenditures on medical treatment, lost productivity that results from those who abuse alcohol, and losses to society from premature deaths of those individuals who are using and abusing alcohol. So just for example, in 2010, some of the hidden costs we see are, so for lost productivity, about $82 billion. Early mortality costs $75 billion. $25 billion was estimated in 2010 as it was related to crime and car crashes cost society about $13 billion in 2010. <clears throat> so employees who abuse alcohol, we find that they tend to spend work time on non-work related activities. They also tend to take long lunch breaks, are late, leave early, or found asleep on the job. And then hangovers can cause absenteeism, or they cause the person to feel sick while they're at work, which means they're performing poorly and maybe even arguing with coworkers. You have increased healthcare costs for those employees, a higher risk of workplace accidents, and reduced productivity overall. So alcohol abuse is the third leading preventable cause of death and it costs the nation nearly $249 billion every year. 19.2 million people reported using or being impaired by alcohol at work at least one time in the past year. And alcohol contributes to 35, I'm sorry, 25 to 30% of all violent crime and has been linked to at least 505 of all highway, I'm sorry, 50% that should read, of all highway fatalities. So let's take a look at the history of alcohol use in America. So when we look at how many gallons of alcohol per year are ingested by the average American, we find that it was 7.1 in 1830 
but it's only two to three in present time. So the first U.S. distillery was established in the 1600s in the area that we now know as New York City. And the triangle trade, which you'll see in the bottom right hand corner of your screen here, continued until Congress passed the act in 1807 that prohibited the importation of slaves. So you'll see here how alcohol was able to travel around the world and how it came into the United States eventually. So when we look at the temperance movement, this was the period of time between 1830 and 1850. During this time, there was a transient population that increased and migration westward began. So the United States during this time was going through uneasy times. So drinking became a form of recre recreation. The first goal well, at first, the goal of the temperance movement was to just simply encourage moderation, not to stop consumption of alcohol. But then a shift happened, and they called for total abstinence. So the temperance movement is also closely tied to the abolitionist movement and African-American churches. Frederick Douglass actually made the point that a master didn't have to worry about a slave who was drunk running away but the sl sober slave is who he needed to watch over. We then lead into the Prohibition era, which was between 1920 and 1933. <clears throat> so during this time, criminal activity flourished as profiteers fought to satisfy the high demand that was being called for alcohol. Violent gang wars broke out over control of the black market on liquor. So speakeasies developed these were illegal establishments where alcohol could be bought and consumed. We also saw corruption in law enforcement and organized crime grew to be legitimate businesses during the Prohibition era, again, as a result of the high demand of alcohol. Bootlegging was also a widely accepted activity. So this is the making, distributing, and selling of alcoholic beverages. And then again, criminal activity just simply flourished. Alcohol also was used as patent medicine being prescribed by doctors and druggists. So during both of these eras, the temperance and prohibition era, we had these patent medicines, which were whiskey and other alcohol products that were prescribed for various ailments. And again, they were being prescribed by doctors and by druggists. So what are the major developments out of the Prohibition era? Alcohol use diminished for the first two to three years after the Prohibition era began. Enforcement of laws against alcohol were thwarted because of those corrupt law enforcement officials. Enforcement of the law was uneven. And law enforcement turnover rates were greater than 50%. Western European immigrants thought prohibition was unnecessary and also an infringement of their right to a common existence because they were, it was part of their culture. They were so used to being able to consume alcohol. So immigrants would actually cook alcohol in bathtubs to sell it illegally. Let's define now alcoholism. Alcoholism is a state of physical and psychological addiction to ethanol. However, there is no one solid definition. So this statement remains true, but there are four common traits among the various definitions of alcoholism. Those are craving, which is a syndrome characterized by mental and physical state resulting from drinking, shown through behavioral and other responses, including a compulsion to drink alcohol, to experience its effects, or to avoid discomfort in its absence. We then have loss of control and being highly impaired. So it's a chronic behavioral disorder manifested by repeated drinking of alcoholic beverages in excess to an extent that interferes with health or social and economic functioning. Physical dependence. This is your chronic primary hereditary disease that progresses from early physiological susceptibility into an addiction characterized by tolerance, changes, 
physiological dependence, and loss of control over drinking. And tolerance. So it's also been described as a chronic primary illness characterized by some loss of control over drinking with habituation or addiction, interfering with major life functions such as work, health, family, and friends. So there is a difference between alcohol abuse and alcoholism disorders. Alcohol abuse is uncontrollable drinking that leads to alcohol craving, less control, and physical dependence to a lesser degree than alcoholism, which alcoholism we would consider an alcoholism disorder. There are also cultural differences to defining what an alcoholic or alcoholism looks like. So in wet cultures, alcohol is integrated into daily life and activities, and it's widely available and accessible Whereas in dry cultures, such as the United States, Canada, and Scandinavian countries, alcohol consumption is not co a common everyday activity and access is more restricted. So Jelenic's personality typology describes a few different types of alcoholics. So first we start with the alpha. This is when a person has psychological dependence to bolster an inability to cope with life. So they become irritable or anxious when alcohol is not available. You then have your beta type where the person has social dependence. So they may be a heavy beer drinker. They can still though meet their social and economic obligations, but they may have some nutritional deficiencies. Your gamma user suffers emotional and psychological impairment. This is the most severe form of alcoholism, psychological dependence that then leads to physical dependence. The delta alcoholic is a maintenance drinker, so they've lost control over their drinking and they drink every day. The epsilon is a binge drinker. So they drink excessively for a period of time and then they'll abstain completely before they do another binge drink. And your zeta typology. This is a pathological drunk or a mad drunk. So it's a moderate drinker who becomes abusive and violent. And these are just different ways to describe the different types of alcoholics that one may see presenting. And then Dr. Moss and colleagues also developed different typologies of alcoholics here. So you have your young adult, so they're going to have low rates of co-occurring substance abuse, other mental health disorders, and family alcoholism. You have your young antisocial. This person's in their mid-20s. They may have an early onset of regular drinking and al alcohol problems. More than 50% are going to come from alcoholic families and 50% have psychiatric diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. The functional alcoholic is someone who's middle-aged, well-educated, has a stable job and a family. They may be one, th one third of them are multi-generational alcoholics and one quarter have major depressive illness. 50% tend to be smokers. You then have your intermediate familial. This is a middle-aged person. 50% are going to come from families with multi-generational alcoholism. 50% of clinical depression. 20% have bipolar disorder. Most are going to smoke. And one-fifth have problems with cocaine and marijuana. This then leads us into our chronic severe alcoholic, who is one that's middle-aged. There's an early onset of drinking and alcohol problems, as well as high rates of antisocial personality disorder, and here's where we see criminality come into play. Again, all of these different typologies and examples of the different types of alcoholics there are can still be influenced by, an, by numerous factors, heredity, your genes, and now we're gonna talk about cultural influences. So generally, American culture views alcoholic beverages as sexy, mature, sophisticated, that facilitate socializing and can enhance one's status. 
This is communicated through our media and advertising. Some religions actually view it as evil, while other religions use it in ceremonies. And in some subcultures, excessive use of alcohol is an indication of manhood, strength, and virility, while in others, it's looked at as disgusting and embarrassing. So behavior demonstrated while under the influence of alcohol within the norms and expectations of a particular culture is known as drunken comportment. So drinking under the idea of, thank goodness it's Friday, drinking at celebrations, festivities, and again, some religious services, or drinking with dinner. Again, these are all going to depend on your culture. Alcohol is a disinhibitor that results in suspension of rational or thoughtful constraints on impulsive behavior. So it depresses the cerebral cortex functions. The individual's expectations of what a drug will do to their personality is known as the set. And the physical and social environment or the setting can also contribute to the effects of alcohol. And pseudo-intoxicated behavior also occurs before or just after a bottle is opened or a drink is being consumed. So this is when one is acting drunk or they're showing uh, mental and cognitive appraisals of drinking that have disinhibitory effects. This is the person who takes one sip of a drink and already acts as if they've consumed two or three. Culture does, however, provide us rules for drinking behavior. So it may tell us when, where, how much, and at what times it's culturally acceptable to drink. So it may be permitted on work hours or it may be disallowed. Moderate drinking may be looked at as permitted, but not drunken behavior. And there may be, it may be looked at as simply just a food item or one that's only to be used in rituals. So speaking of those rituals, ceremonial meanings for alcohol use, it can have familial and sacra sacramental significance. You have this versus your male convivial bonding. So when it's being used for ceremonial uses, this is, um, sorry, the, so the Hasidic Jews will use it for those familial and sacramental significant ceremonies. So it's only to be used on holidays and the Sabbath versus Irish who look at alcohol use as male convivial bonding. So Irish tend to identify themselves as heavy drinkers because of historical high rates of use among the Irish. So again, culture is defining this for us. Looking at models of alcoholism. So South Bronx Hispanics may view alcoholism as a spell and evil eye or witchcraft an addiction may be ignored, or they may call upon supernatural solutions or a folk cure. Or, in the other view, African Americans may interpret problems as a punishment from God, and they subscribe to a moral model that conflicts with the medical models. And then attitudes regarding alcohol consumption can be based on religious beliefs, racial and ethnic differences, the geographical region where you live, social upbringing, and even peer group dynamics. So culture provides us a lot of different factors to know when, where, how much, and at what times drinking is appropriate. So again, attitudes regarding alcohol consumption, we also have social class, income, education, and occupational differences. However, with that being said, there are some misleading cultural stereotypes. So students at historically African-American colleges and universities consume less alcohol and other drugs compared to their white counterparts. That's a fact, although cultural stereotypes may have you thinking otherwise. White students drink significantly more than African-American students. Domin Dominicans drink, drank less after migration 
viewing drunkenness as indecent. Guatemalans drank more after migration, viewing drunkenness as glamorous and sentimentalized. Hispanic men were two times as likely to be heavy drinkers compared to white and African Americans. So you'll see here how some stereotypes you may have had in your head are proven false by some of these facts. Now when we look at college students and alcohol use, related to alcohol use, college students experience death, injury, and assault. They develop alcohol use disorders and related health problems. They drive under the influence, damage property, and become involved with the law. So according to the Core Institute survey, the average college student consumed 4.4 drinks per week. 81% of college students drank in the previous year, while 69% reported that they drank in the previous 30 days and 43% reported that they binged in the previous 30 days. So college students between the ages of 18 and 24, when we're looking at all of these negative effects they can experience, there were 1,800 deaths, 599,000 injuries, 696,000 assaults by another student who was drinking, and 97,000 alcohol-related sexual assaults. 20% of college students will meet the criteria for an alcohol use disorder. While you have 150,000, that will develop alcohol-related health problems. 3.36 million will drive under the influence 11% have damaged property or engaged in vandalism, and 5% have, been, have become involved with the police or campus security for alcohol-related violations. So when we look at binge drinking in college students, the strongest predictor for someone to binge drink was living in a sorority or a fraternity house. Students who were engaged or involved in community service in the arts or frequent studying were less likely to be binge drinkers. Looking at gender and the differences in use, males will drink more frequently, tend to binge more often, and will experience greater consequences from alcohol use. We can, alcohol use results in fighting, again, property damage and trouble with the law. And finally, drinking inversely is inversely related with academic achievement in both genders. So for both males and females, drinking and your grades are inversely related. Drinking is not going to help you pass college. When we look at alcohol consumption and patterns in women, women actually have a greater sensitivity to alcohol. So they have a likelihood of addiction and develop alcohol-related health problems sooner. So why do women respond differently? They have smaller body size, typically. We absorb alcohol quicker because of our higher body fat and possess less of the metabolizing enzyme that will rid the body of the alcohol. So heavier drinking is found in women who are unemployed, divorced, separated, or never married those who have depression, infertility, menopausal changes, and in women who traditionally have masculine occupations and higher levels and are in higher levels of management, such as executives, or those in traditional blue collar occupations. The role then that alcohol plays when we look at domestic violence, there is a significant relationship between alcohol abuse and incidents of battering. Domestic violence is defined as physical, sexual, emotional, economic, and psychological abuse or battering through the use of fear and intimidation. 15%, this is 15% higher in households where the husband was often drunk. Roughly 50% of cases do involve alcohol. 87% of females 
and alcoholics were physically or sexually abused as children. When we look at alcohol and its relation to sex, alcohol is linked to a very large proportion of unwanted sexual behaviors, such as acquaintance and date rape, unplanned pregnancies, and even STDs. So when we look at acquaintance and date rape, this is defined as unplanned and unwanted forced sexual attacks from either a friend or a dating partner. 19% of women reported attempted or completed rape by force or while incapacitated due to alcohol or drugs during their freshman year. Factors can include disinhibition, poor judgment, unconsciousness, impulsivity, and even a feeling, feelings of helplessness. How does alcohol then affect the family? Well, now we're going to discuss codependency and enabling behaviors. So these often occur together, but there is a difference. So codependency is behavior by addicted or non-addicted family members who identify with the alcohol addict and cover up their excessive drinking. While enabling is when those close to the addict deny or make excuses for enabling the excessive drinking. It is known as a family disease because it affects all members of the family. And addiction to alcohol can be passed through genetics. So children who are living with an alcoholic will experience higher levels of family conflict, are at a higher risk for alcoholism and drug abuse, and are more likely to marry an alcoholic. Children and adults of alcoholics will exhibit more symptoms of depression and anxiety. <clears throat> so adult children of alcoholic parents share some of the following characteristics. They become isolated. They become approval seekers. They are frightened of angry people, terrified of personal criticism, tend to have an overwhelming and exaggerated sense of responsibility, love people who need rescuing, have low self-esteem, are concerned more with others than they are with themselves, and will judge themselves often very harshly. So with all of these effects of alcohol on college students, adolescents, the differences between males and females, on families, on children, what do we do about it? Well, we have different treatments for alcohol addiction. So treatment of alcohol addiction must consider physical withdrawal and denial in treatment. So relapsing syndrome occurs frequently due to the ready availability and the social environment we have that encourages drinking. So Alcoholics Anonymous encourages doing 90 meetings in 90 days to remain sober and also recommends keeping memory of the misery of addiction fresh so that one does not relapse. Acute alcohol withdrawal syndrome occurs when a person is addicted to alcohol and they don't maintain their usual BAC level. So this can actually be dangerous and life threatening. One can experience severe muscle tremors, nausea and anxiety, and this should be treated under the care of medical supervision. Symptoms will usually appear within 12 to 72 hours, but happen whenever that BAC level falls below a certain point. Delirium tremens is a life-threatening condition where an individual will hallucinate, be delirious, and suffer from a high fever and a rapid heartbeat. So the areas that we need to treat are preventing withdrawal symptoms with prescription drugs, such as using antabuse or naltrexone. Again, antabuse will make the person physically sick when they drink. Naltrexone is gonna block the euphoric effects and feelings of intoxication. We also need to address malnutrition and vitamin deficiencies, because remember, alcoholics are consuming nearly 50% of their calories in alcohol, and they're empty calories. They're also damaging their internal organs, in their digestive system, their intestines, their stomach. So when they do eat, those nutrients are not being absorbed properly. And we also need to look for concerns of pneumonia in an alcoholic. So again, alcohol 
alcoholism is a family disease. So we need to make sure that we're helping the entire alcoholic family recover. So all members of the alcoholic family should participate in family therapy. All members will participate, and sometimes this includes multiple generations of alcoholics. Using the family's strengths and resources, they'll find ways for the person to live life without alcohol and ameliorate the impact of dependency on the individual and family. So family therapy can also help the family to better understand patterns of thinking and communication. So thinking is going to be looking at the denial, minimization, rationalization, shame, blame, and project projection they engage in, where improving the communication is because typically these individuals are chaotic, destructive, manipulative, and again, blame. So these family systems will actually adapt to dysfunction by rearranging itself around the problem or the problem individual, which gives room for enabling behaviors. So family members may take on roles and enjoy certain aspects to that role that they don't want to give up if the addicted family member gets treatment. So an example of this is someone who maybe takes on a hero or extra responsibility role. They may, that may give them feelings of importance, of heroism and capability. So this role solidifies to the point where the family member then ascribes to this role. And so if the addicted family member recovers, they may not be needed so much. They may not need to take on those extra responsibilities but they've now developed their personality and themselves around this role, so that's gonna be very hard for them to break. Some of the examples used in family therapy are psychodrama or role-playing, or they may have them draw out a genogram. Again, the entire alcoholic family is affected and can experience post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a psychiatric syndrome in which the individual exposed to a traumatic event or situation experiences persistent psychological stress that can manifest in a wide range of symptoms, including re-experiencing the trauma, numbing, or hyperarousal. So it's very important, again, that we are treating the entire family and not just the alcoholic to make sure that that person is successful. In sum, alcohol consumption is highest in Europe, followed by the Americas and Africa. The three major economic costs of alcohol use are expenditures on medical treatment, lost productivity, and losses to society from premature deaths. The goal of the temperance movement from the 1930s to 1950s changed from moderation of use to total abstinence. During the Prohibition era, criminal activity flourished through speakeasies, bootlegging, and violent gang wars resulting from the high demand for alcohol. Alcoholism is a state of physical and psychological addiction to ethanol and can be defined in numerous ways, but it shares four common traits. Cravings, loss of control and highly impaired, physical dependence, and tolerance. There are six ways in which cultural influences affect alcohol use, that in being the rules for drinking behavior, ceremonial meaning, models of alcoholism, attitudes regarding alcohol consumption, misleading cultural stereotypes, and what is considered acceptable amounts of drinking. Culture influences our view of alcohol determined through social and psychological experiences and expectations defined as drunken comportment, including set, setting, and pseudo-intoxication. College students who drink, experience death, injury, and assault, tend to develop alcohol use disorders and related health problems, drive under the influence, damage property, and become involved with the law, and are more likely to belong to a fraternity or sorority if they're binge drinkers. 
Women respond differently to alcohol than men because they have smaller body sizes, typically, absorb alcohol quicker because of higher body fat, and possess less of the metabolizing enzyme that rids the body of alcohol. Codependency is behavior by addicted or non-addicted family members who identify with the alcohol addict and cover up excessive drinking while enabling refers to those close to the addict who deny or make excuses for enabling the excessive drinking. And finally, alcohol treatment must consider physical withdrawal and denial. And that was your chapter eight lecture. Again, as usual, if you have any questions, please reach out and I hope you all have a wonderful week.